polymetus, someone who is never at a loss. The epithet most used by Homer for Odysseus is polymetus, which literally means of many counsels or the powerful schema. Since in Greek, metus refers to good counsel and the ability to cleverly ensure that things turn out well, it means the stratagem, the simulation, the hunter's trap, the feint, and inspired wit. Hence it is the quick-witted man's virtue par excellence. At the same time, Metis is the proper name of a goddess of intelligence whom Zeus pursues in his usual manner. He fathers a child with her, whose birth he fears, since it has been foretold that the child would be his equal in intelligence, which prompts him to devour the pregnant mother. He winds up with a very difficult brain pregnancy as a result. Hesphaestus relieves the headache by striking Zeus on the skull with a double axe, so that Athena can leap out of his head armed with a lance and wearing a full suit of armour. Zeus later comes to terms with his exceptionally wise daughter, and when Athena offers candid opinions during the gods' council, he contents himself by saying to her in a paternal tone, My child, what strange remarks you let escape you. In what follows, I would like to make a case for my basic thesis that ancient Greek intellectual culture, informed by Metis as it appears in the Odyssey and is reflected in various Hellenistic myths about cunning, represents a different, a distant prelude to what in our view is the most Greek of all phenomena, the sophistic movement, which led to a secession of philosophy in the 4th century. In contemporary German, a society animated by sophistic arts would be called a Streitkultur, translated to agonistic culture. We can see here that even though Germany has a word for this phenomenon, it lacks the thing itself, because instead of a Streitkultur, we have an accusatory culture, Hetzkultur, a culture of denunciation. A culture of disparagement in which things are decided in advance before they have a chance to even become controversial. In contrast, the Greek polis was organised on an agonistic basis. Not only were there organised interests and divergent classes in every city, there was a ubiquitous pluralism of claims of nobility and excellence that could not have been made without a rhetorically articulated competition between the claimants. To truly understand the sophistic movement in its original sense, we must rid it of the bad name given it by the Academy, a reputation it received partly on valid logical grounds and partly from dubious strategic motives. One of the positive effects of Nietzsche's epochal emergence in the recent history of ideas was that even academic philosophy was compelled to reevaluate the sophistic movement. In our present context, we can resume this reconsideration by observing that the sophistic movement signifies precisely the continuation of the Odyssean praxis of intelligence with urban means. The homecoming hero's capacity to negotiate a viable future for himself with every power in the world, with the gods, with human beings, indeed with the sea itself, recurs in the polis as the capacity of orators and lawyers to navigate the sea of disputes within the city, in between cities, and to conclude their mandates successfully. If Homer often endows the storm-tossed voyaging hero with the epithet Polymetus, he is not merely labelling a specific person, but characterising a type of masculine existence in which renowned heroic vigour, in other words the ability to make an impact, for the first time concludes a new kind of compromise with cunning, with a purely navigational or operative cunning. Such cunning thought still remains entirely bound to current situations. This early version of cunning is still a long way from abstract theory. The characteristic feature of Odyssean intelligence is that it understands itself to be dealing with the challenges that fate has posed for it from day to day, from port to port, and from case to case. 
The challenges to be overcome by the seafarer on his delayed journey home are prototypes of what will one day be called, quote-unquote, problems. But there can only be problems at all if homecoming heroes have turned into argumentative citizens, and if they have transformed the monsters at the ends of the earth into mere legal adversaries. In the urban space, a free-ranging intelligence forms concepts that are gradually detached from the level of given cases and concrete examples. The desire to have and to solve quote-unquote problems begins to flourish with the cunning of Polymetus. Odysseus changes into the maneuverability of the urban or quote-unquote political rhetoric that distinguished lawyers and orators at the peak of Hellenistic culture. There is a moving episode in the Odyssey that is a powerful example of Polymetus Odysseus's art. I am thinking of the shipwrecked sailor landing on the beach of the island of Phaeacia. After a storm has destroyed the raft that was supposed to bring him home when he left the nymph Calypso behind. More than half drowned with his last bit of strength, he saves himself and, after several days of floating around on the tempestuous sea, ends up on the beach where... Stumbling into the bushes, he falls into a deep sleep, concealed by a hedge. On the following day, Nausicaa, the daughter of King Alcinous, and her maids head to the shore to wash their clothing and discover the unkempt, shipwrecked voyager who emerges from his hiding place at that very moment. Homer sets the scene, showing how the unclothed foreigner winds up in the young woman's view. Odysseus had this look in his rough skin, advancing on the girls with pretty braids, and he was driven on by hunger too. Streaked with brine and swollen, he terrified them, so that they fled this way and that. Only Alcinous's daughter stood her ground, being given a bold heart by Athena and steady knees. Odysseus is now faced with a fateful choice. He can either throw himself at the feet of, quote-unquote, this beauty, and clasp her knees, or stand away from the young woman and appeal to her from afar with flattering words. After deliberating for a moment, he realises that he prefers the second option, because he is mindful that a daughter from a good house might easily become annoyed if he were to presume to touch her knees without permission. This consideration leads to the shipwrecked voyager's speech on the shore, or as Homer puts it, he, quote-unquote, let the soft words fall. In terms of the history of rhetoric, this can be viewed as the first plea ever made by a lawyer pro se on European soil. The naked speaker mounts the rostrum that his need has erected, and devotes himself to the task of winning, of winning the harshest public in the world, the bold heart of a young woman, over to his side. Mistress, please, are you divine or mortal? If one of those who dwell in the wide heaven, you are most near to Artemis, I should say, great Zeus's daughter in your grace and presence. If you are one of the earth's inhabitants, how blessed your father and your gentle mother, blessed all your kin. I know what happiness must send the warm tears to their eyes each time they see their wondrous child go to the dancing. But one man's destiny is more than blessed, he who prevails and takes you as his bride. Never have I laid eyes on equal beauty in man or woman. I am hushed indeed. So, fair, one time... I thought a young palm tree at Delos near the altar of Apollo. I had troops under me when I was there, on the sea route that later brought me grief. But that slim palm tree filled my heart with wonder. Never came shoot from earth so beautiful. So now, my lady, I stand in awe so great, I cannot take your knees. And yet my case is desperate. Twenty days yesterday in the wine-dark sea, on the ever-lunging swell under gale winds, getting away from the island of Ogygia. And now the terror of storm has left me stranded upon this shore, with more blows yet to suffer, I must believe, before the gods relent. 
Mistress, do me a kindness. After much weary toil I come to you, and you are the first soul I have seen. I know no others here. Direct me to the town. Give me a rag that I can throw around me, some cloth or wrapping that you brought along, and may the gods accomplish your desire. A home, a husband, and harmonious conversation with them. But the white-armed maiden Nausicaa says, Stranger, there is no quirk or evil in you that I can see. We can clearly see that Odysseus on the shores of Phaishea does not have what we would call a quote-unquote problem at all. He is in need, in a tight squeeze with only one way out, precisely where the young woman is standing. The man that Homer calls Polymetus is a warrior who has learned to transform every hardship into a challenge. From his nakedness he makes an argument, and he forms a project out of his destitution. He is literally someone who is never at a loss. We should never forget that at the inception of European rhetoric, we find a sea monster making its plea and frightening off young woman. Only one brave maiden holds her ground to form an audience. A miracle occurs in her ears. The salt-encrusted monster opens its mouth and reveals itself to be the most human of all human beings. The Zoeon Logon Ekon, as defined a half millennium later by Aristotle, the living being that has speech. He stands at the beach with his irresistible flattery, his musical declamation, and his ability to make a virtue, that of beautiful speech, out of the most urgent necessity. It then occurs to Nausicaa that she might fall in love with a man who speaks to her this way. Not so much because of his quite forward compliments which drift past her like a warm breeze, but because she feels, and suspects, that a good and clever man stands before her. She has experienced a logophony, proof that language, as soon as it comes into its own, elevates the human being. If the dishevelled foreigner is not a god, he has provided proof of his humanity by speaking as no beast, no fool, and no villain could. From here we proceed further in an almost direct line to a scene that played out centuries later in Athens. In one of his dialogues, Plato tells us how a father brings his teenage son to Socrates the sophist, who was known for his ability to educate youth. Socrates turned to the young man with a single request— Speak, boy, so that I may see you. The belief in logophanic revelation of the human being's essential nature reaches its culmination here. At the same time, Odysseus's plea on the beach also leads directly to other 5th century sophists who were famous for their ability to argue any position. Isocrates, the prince of Greek lawyers, demonstrates how significant this influence was in his notorious Helene encomion, encomium of Helen, which is supposed to prove that a good lawyer can win a case that seems lost in advance. What case could be more hopeless than the one against the most fatal woman of antiquity, the unfaithful beauty for whose sake the Trojan War must be fought? We learn of Gorgias that, in his case, the ability to speak about anything at all degenerated into his really being a know-it-all, in one anecdote we read, quote, For coming into the theatre of the Athenians, he had the boldness to say, Suggest a subject. And he was the first to proclaim himself willing to take this chance, showing apparently that he knew everything and would trust to the moment to speak on any subject. End quote. Only one aspect of the story is of interest here. Gorgias has walked every step of the path, that leads from a distress that can still find words to playing with mere quote-unquote problems. This can be observed in the word he uses to challenge the Athenian public to propose a topic for him. The word is probaliti, from the verb probalein, meaning to throw something at him, to suggest something to him, to pose a topic a word from which both ancient and modern problemata derive. 
The quote-unquote problem that Gorgias wanted to quote-unquote solve in the theatre was simply a random topic for an expert to develop a thesis on or for a virtuoso to use as a basis for extemporization. If the sophistic movement is supposed to involve the translation of existential hardships into a kind of relaxed playing with topics, then Odysseus is not yet a sophist in this sense. Odyssean intelligence is still bound to the harsh necessities of the struggle for survival, and cannot claim the privilege of relaxed observation for itself. Nevertheless, we can trace a line of descent from him to the sophistic movement, since we discover in Polymetus Odysseus the first signs of a general craft consciousness that is an essential feature of classical Greek civilization. From a distance, the Odyssey already heralds that great event in the history of thought which can only really be called the Greek miracle. The birth of problems from the proud, proud awareness of being able to deal with them. The brilliant words of an Austrian essayist written before the First World War seems appropriate for 5th century Greeks. Quote, Culture has a wealth of problems, and the more mysteries it discovers, the more enlightened it is. End quote. We could even say instead that culture is the sum of relief efforts, entlastungen, in response to primal needs. Decadence sets in the moment that the recipients of such relief forget why they needed culture to relieve them in the first place. <laughs>